Billed as the best rivalry in baseball and possibly all of sports, the Yankees and Red Sox rivalry has been built on for over a century. From the curse of the Bambino to Bucky Dent, the 20th century was a one-sided rivalry. But as the playoffs expanded and the 21st century began, this gave a chance for more postseason competition, and a level of hatred between teams and fan bases never seen before. So let's look at the years that brought the peak of the Yankees and Red Sox rivalry. Totally sports. Ask. Major League. 1903 was an important year in baseball history, with the obvious reason being that it brought the first World Series seeing the American League champions going against the National League champions. And in that series, the NL Pittsburgh Pirates faced the Boston Americans, who would later become the Red Sox. And the Americans won the series in eight games. And 1903 was also the first season of the New York Yankees franchise, after moving from the Baltimore Orioles, not the current one, but a defunct team that lasted for two seasons. In the first 10 seasons, they were known as the New York Highlanders, and they didn't do much. They finished second three times, but weren't competitive in other years, and even went 50-102 and in their last season as the Highlanders, and through the rest of the decade, they still weren't competitive, with their 1919 season giving them their best finish at third. As for the Red Sox, the name they developed in 1908, things were different. After winning the first World Series, they were set to play in the second, but it was cancelled after the Giants refused to play with no formal agreement officially being made between the two teams. But while they regressed for the rest of the decade, through the 1910s, they were the best franchise in baseball. They went to the 1912, 1915, 1916, and 1918 World Series and won every single one of them, with all-time players playing in Boston this time, such as Tris Speaker, Jimmy Fox, Cy Young, and Babe Ruth. And though they didn't win at all in 1919, they saw record-breaking attendance thanks to main part to pitcher Babe Ruth getting to hit full time and hitting a record 29 home runs. And with this, Babe wanted to renegotiate his contract to double his very high $10,000 salary, even threatening to sit out the next season if demands weren't met. With mounting pressure that would reach all areas of the team and personal financial issues despite the record-breaking season, owner Harry Frazzi opted to sell Babe Ruth to the Yankees for a record $100,000 on December 26, 1919 a day which can be seen as the day the rivalry was born. As though some fans felt Ruth was difficult to work with and not concerned about the trade, eventually, they would wish Ruth remained in a Red Sox uniform. In his first season with the Yankees, he broke his own record by hitting 54 home runs. In the following season, he would break it again by hitting 59. And by the end of the decade, he would hit 40 or more home runs in eight seasons, often out hitting other teams, including his former team. In the 1920s, Babe Ruth hit 152 more home runs than the entire Red Sox teams. And unsurprisingly, with that stat alone, both teams went in different directions. By the end of the 20s, the Yankees had more pennants than the Red Sox, though they only won three of those World Series. The Yankees had a winning percentage of 608 in the 20s, while the Red Sox had a winning percentage of 388. And unlike the Red Sox at the end of the 1910s, the Yankees could build off their success, with the 1930s being an even better decade. They went to five World Series in this decade and won every single one of them. The Red Sox began to compete at the end of the decade with the addition of Ted Williams, but never made it, and the 30s were a sign of things to come throughout the 20th century. The Red Sox did win a pennant in 1946, but lost the World Series in seven to the Cardinals. And throughout Ted Williams' legendary career that ended in 1960, Boston fans watched numerous legends play for the Yankees. When Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig retired, Joe DiMaggio came along. When DiMaggio retired, Mickey Mantle came along, not to mention the numerous All-Star and Hall of Fame players that made up those teams. To end the 40s, the Red Sox needed to win just one of their final two games to win the pennant. And instead, they lost their last two games to the Yankees, who won the pennant and the World Series, and went on to win another four in a row to bring their total World Series to 15. By the time the Red Sox won another pennant in 1967, in which they lost another World Series in seven to the Cardinals, the Yankees had 19 World Series. But the late 60s and early 70s was the worst era for the Yankees after the Ruth trade. Meanwhile, the Red Sox were competitive and finally broke through to win the 1975 pennant. And one of the best World Series of all time, the Red Sox' best moment of the 20th century after 1918 came in Game 6. And one of the best games of all time that was back and forth all night, in the 12th inning, Carlton Fisk guided a ball fair that hit the left field foul pole to give them the win. An iconic home run that became the ultimate you just assume they won the series after that. But they didn't as they lost Game 7 the next night. And next year, the Yankees would win their first pennant in 14 years, ultimately also losing to the Reds. But they would win the World Series the next year, and the year after that brought the ultimate representation of the rivalry in the 20th century. The Red Sox had a 14-game lead over the Yankees in mid-July, but the Yankees caught fire. And after they swept the Red Sox in a four-game series on September 10th, better known as the Boston Massacre to fans, they were tied. The Yankees would hold a three-and-a-half game lead a week later, but the Red Sox caught fire to end the season, setting up for a one-game playoff for the AL East. 
the Red Sox took a 2-0 lead on a Jim Roy single, and that brought things to the top of the seventh. Chris Chambliss and Roy White hit one-out singles, then Jim Spencer flied out, bringing up Bucky Dent, with two outs and two on. Dent had only hit four home runs that year, and never hit eight in a season in his entire career. But on that day, Dent hit his fifth of the season, clearing the green monster to give the Yankees a 3-2 lead. The Yankees would add on two more, and so would the Red Sox. But that wasn't enough, and the Yankees won the AL East and went on to win their second World Series in a row and 22nd overall, an event that earned Bucky Dent the nickname of Bucky F***ing Dent, a pure visual representation of the rivalry in the 20th century. And the pure visual representation of the Red Sox curse came eight years later, when the Red Sox were able to win the pennant. They took a 3-2 lead over the Mets and took a 5-3 lead in the 10th of Game 6. And then they were one out away from ending decades of agony with no one on base. In fact, the Mets accidentally flashed a congratulatory message on the scoreboard. But then, the Mets chipped away, coming within one run. And that turned into no runs when Bob Stanley threw a wild pitch with Mookie Wilson up that tied the game. Then four pitches later, Mookie put the ball in play. The ball trickled down the line, and as Stanley broke late, it didn't matter when the ball went under Bill Buckner's glove. The Mets won the game, and won Game 7, as Buckner became a huge and undeserved scapegoat for the collapse, joining Bucky Dent in the faces of the curse that grew in prominence after the game. And after losing those last two games, they lost their next 11 playoff games, in total bringing it to 13, a record they held until the Twins later broke it with 18. They lost 8 of those 11 to the A's and 3 to the Indians in 1995. And that brought things to 1996, where the greatest era of this rivalry began. It's not because of any head-to-head -head matchups, but rather that this was the start of another Yankees dynasty, with Red Sox great Wade Boggs on the team, along with the core of this dynasty in Derek Jeter, Andy Pettit, Jorge Posada, and Mariano Rivera, the Yankees won the World Series over the defending champion Braves. And though they lost in the ALDS the next year, the 98 Yankees proved to be one of the greatest teams of all time, winning 114 games and going 11-2 in the playoffs to win another World Series. The Red Sox did make the playoffs that year, losing to the Indians, and in the long run, the most important part of the year for the Red Sox was the first year of Pedro Martinez in Boston. He finished second in Cy Young voting and will put up a historic season in 1999. In a year dominated by hitters, Pedro won the pitching triple crown with a 2.07 ERA and a K per 9 of 13.2. And the moment of the year came on September 10th. After giving up a home run to Chili Davis in the second, Pedro wouldn't allow another Yankee to reach base, striking out 17, the most ever against the Yankees in a nine inning game. And with Pedro leading the way, they won the wild card, only possible after playoff expansion coming after the 94 strike. In the ALDS, the Yankees would sweep the Rangers, and the Red Sox would finally beat the Indians in a five-game series, coming back from a 2-0 deficit. So now the league got what they wanted with the wildcard expansion, as these two teams are facing off in a playoff series for a chance to advance to the World Series. And you can perfectly see how this rivalry was in the 20th century with this series. In Game 1, the Yankees tied things in the 7th, then Bernie Williams would hit a walk-off home run in the 10th inning. Williams was nervous before the game, but calmed down when Yogi Berra told him, Relax, we've been beating these guys for 80 years. And it was more of the same the next night. The Yankees came back in the 7th to take the lead and win Game 2. The Boston fans got their glimpse of glory in Game 3. On the mound for the Red Sox was Pedro Martinez. For the Yankees was former Red Sox Roger Clemens. And Clemens did not have a fun time in his playoff return, as he was done in the 3rd as the Red Sox went up 6-0 as Red Sox fans chanted, Where is Roger? Other fans responded with, In the shower. It was a fun night for Red Sox fans as they won by 12, and Pedro struck out 12. But the next night was not so fun. Daryl Strawberry signs the crowd that was chanting his name, and Just Say No, a reference to Strawberry's addiction to candy, and by the end of the night, fans were throwing trash on the field. In the 8th, as the Red Sox trailed by 1, John Valentin hit a ground ball to Chuck Knobloch, who tagged Jose Offerman and threw to first for the double play. The problem here being, Knobloch didn't actually tag him, but without replay, there was nothing they could do, and what would become known as the Phantom Tag. And that was huge, as the momentum carried over, as the Yankees scored 6 in the top of the ninth. And after Nomar Garcia Parro swore out in the ninth, Jimmy Williams was ejected for arguing, and Red Sox fans would throw trash on the field as the Red Sox would lose 9-2. And the next night, there was no reason to throw anything on the field, as the Red Sox never had the lead, as the Yankees won 6-1 to win their third pennant in four years. And they would proceed to win the third World Series in four years, with Game 3 being their only loss of the postseason, a very fitting end to the century, and a series that defined the rivalry to that point. With the Red Sox blowing late leads in the first two games, fans getting a glimpse of hope in Game 3, only to have the Yankees crush their spirits in the next two games. And it wasn't like things suddenly switched as the century switched. 
As the year of 2000 saw the Yankees beat the Red Sox 22-1 at Fenway, and even with a record of 87-74, the Yankees won the AL East over the Red Sox, and went on to win their third straight World Series over their second biggest rival in the Mets. And the following season saw a moment of peace between the two in the aftermath of 9-11. The time of solidarity was bigger than the game, but naturally wouldn't last too long. The Yankees would again win the AL East and beat the 116-win Mariners to win another pennant, but they couldn't four-peat as the Diamondbacks walked them off in Game 7. Ultimately, a big moment in the saga that was a great hate watch for Red Sox fans. But the biggest outcome in the months after the Red Sox 2001 season came to an end was new ownership. John Henry along with Tom Werner and other investors founded the New England Sports Ventures and purchased the Red Sox prior to the 2002 season. With an analytical approach, famously seen at the end of Moneyball, the group had one goal which was to break the curse of the Bambino. They asked George Steinbrenner for permission to interview one of his assistants for the vacant GM position, but Steinbrenner didn't allow it. And instead of hiring Billy Bean, they hired Larry Lachino's prodigy and Theo Epstein. At 28 years old, he was the youngest GM in the history of baseball, but curse breaking would be a bullet point on his resume. The Red Sox would not make the playoffs in 2002, and the Yankees would lose in the ALDS. But neither team was slowing down. The Red Sox signed David Ortiz and Kevin Millar, while the Yankees added Hideki Matsui. And for the third straight year as a result of the unbalanced schedule, the Yankees and Red Sox were set to face each other 19 times. And to add fuel to the fire, Red Sox president Larry Luchino declared the Yankees to be the evil empire after Jose Contreras opted to sign with the Yankees over the Red Sox before 2003. And this was the first year of the absolute two-year peak of this rivalry. These two faced each other for the first time in mid-May, and the Yankees took two out of three in Boston. And at the end of the month, the Yankees took another two from them in New York. Their next series would come with a four-game series over the 4th of July weekend, and the Red Sox scored 10 in each of the first two games, but scored just one in the last two, for a four-game split. It would be another three-game series before the end of July, in which the Red Sox took two out of three, still one and a half games behind the Yankees. And the biggest day of the regular season came three days later. On July 31st, aka the trade deadline, the Red Sox traded Freddie Sanchez and Mike Gonzalez for Jeff Supan. Meanwhile, the Yankees traded Brandon Clawson, Charlie Manning, and Cash to the Cincinnati Reds for Aaron Boone. Boone just played in his first and only All-Star game for the Reds, and well, as we'll see and most probably already know, this would be a massive move. They would play each other at the end of August, and after the Yankees took two out of three, they would go up by five and a half games. But after the Red Sox took two against them, a week later, the lead was down to two and a half. But it would never go lower than that, as for the sixth straight year, the Yankees won the AL East, spending just nine days out of first. But with the 95 wins, the Red Sox won the wild card for the third time in five years. The Yankees were set up to face the Twins in the ALDS, and if you have any idea of how Yankees vs. Twins playoff matches in the 21st century have gone, then it's not surprising to know that the Yankees won in four games. They actually lost the first game, but didn't allow the Twins to score more than a run in the last three games. The Red Sox, on the other hand, were set up to face a team led by someone who was almost their GM in Billy Bean. And after losing Game 1 in extras, the Red Sox would lose Game 2 to go down 2-0. Now the possibility of another Yankee Red Sox ALCS seemed dim, but the Red Sox responded by winning Game 3 with a two-run walk-off home run by Trot Nixon in the 11th. And in Game 4, they again won the game in late innings with two runs in the 8th to force a Game 5. And in Oakland, the Red Sox scored four in the sixth, and that was enough as they held off a late rally by the A's to win the series. This was the third time a team came back from a 2-0 deficit in a five-game series. The 95 Mariners did so against the Yankees. Then the 99 and 03 Red Sox came back to face the Yankees in the ALCS. So now, after facing each other 19 times, these two were going to face each other at least four more times. And things would get nasty. The same person who would throw the last pitch of the series for the Red Sox would throw the first pitch, and that was Tim Wakefield, who threw a gem in Game 1, giving up just two hits in the second and giving up no runs in the six innings. Meanwhile, the Red Sox got to Mike Mussina, hitting three home runs off him as he would record 13 hits and take Game 1. And in Game 2, the Red Sox took a second inning lead off Andy Pettit, but lost at that same inning, as the Yankees went on to win this game 6-2 to tie the series as things went to Boston. And Game 3 is where things started to get nasty. It was a rematch of Game 3 of the 1999 ALCS, as Pedro Martinez was on the mound for the Red Sox, while Roger Clemens took the mound for the Yankees. The Red Sox took an early 2-0 lead, but the Yankees tied things in the third, and after Hideki Matsui's ground rule double in the fourth, the Yankees took the lead. And with runners on second and third, Pedro's first pitch to Kareem Garcia hit him in the back, and Garcia took exception. Garcia and Martinez had a stare down as words were exchanged between both teams, causing warnings to be issued, which surprisingly didn't immediately calm things down. Alfonso Soriano would hit into a double play that scored a run, and Garcia slid hard in the second, and tensions carried into the next inning. 
On Clemens' fourth pitch against Manny Ramirez, he threw high and inside, probably not trying to hit him, but with emotions high, Ramirez got upset and went after Clemens, causing benches to clear. And out of the dugout came 72-year-old Don Zimmer, who went after Pedro Martinez, and well, Martinez sidestepped him, got a hold of his head, and threw him to the ground. A lasting image of the rivalry that caused a 13-minute delay and caused Fenway Park to stop serving beer for the rest of the game. Clemens would end up striking out Ramirez, and the Red Sox quarreling one more as they lost 4-3. But the rest of the game wasn't peaceful. After ending the top of the ninth with a double play, a groundskeeper cheered and led rally chants, and Yankees in the bullpen were not pleased. A scuffle broke out between the groundskeeper and Jeff Nelson, but Kareem Garcia hopping the fence to join in. The groundskeeper would end up going to the hospital, while Garcia had to come out of the game with a cut on his left hand. Game 4 was moved from Sunday to Monday as a result of the rain, allowing for a Game 1 pitching rematch. And once again, Tim Wakefield was great, and Mike Bucino was as well. Todd Walker hit a solo home run in the 4th, then Jeter's double tied things in the 5th. But another Red Sox solo home run in the bottom half from Trot Nixon gave them a lead that they never surrendered. As Scott Williamson picked up his second save of the series, as the series was now tied, setting up for a massive Game 5. The Red Sox had their Game 2 starter in Derek Lowe, while the Yankees were starting David Wells. And the Yankees jumped on Lowe early, scoring three runs in the second, and that would be all they needed, as well as quieted their bats and the crowd, giving up one over seven. As the Red Sox made a little comeback off Mariano in the 8th and the ninth, it wasn't enough, as the Yankees were now one win away from another pennant, and all hope seemed lost in Boston. But they rebounded in Game 6 in New York. In a high-scoring back-and-forth game, the Yankees took a first-inning lead, but the Red Sox 4-1 third put them ahead for just a minute, as the Yankees had a four-run inning of their own in the fourth and added another in the fifth to go up by two. Then in the seventh, Nomar led off the inning with a triple, and errors, walks, and more hits would end with three runs for the Red Sox and the lead. They would add two more in the eighth, as Williamson picked up his third save to set up a Game 7 in the Bronx the biggest game in nearly 20 years for the Red Sox, and they had who they wanted on the mound in Pedro Martinez. And well, the Yankees also had who they wanted on the mound in Roger Clemens. But Clemens' start was not ideal. After a scoreless first, the Red Sox jumped on him in the second. After Trot Nixon's two-run home run, and an error that brought in Jason Veritek. Clemens would pitch one more inning before being pulled in the fourth after Kevin Millar home run, and a walk, and a single. Mike Mussina came in after two previous starts in the series and was locked down, just like Pedro Martinez, who had been locked down since the start. But the Yankees slowly creep back from their four-run deficit with Jason Giambi's solo home runs in the fifth and the seventh. And that brought things to the eighth. David Ortiz would hit a huge solo home run to put the Red Sox up by three. And with this, Grady Little made the still discussed move to keep Pedro Martinez in the game after 100 pitches. He induced a pop fly, but concerns came in after a Derek Jeter double. And even more concern came when Bernie Williams hit an RBI single, which prompted a mound meeting. Most assumed Pedro was coming out of the game with 115 pitches, but Little decided not to go with the lefty to face Hideki Matsui. And this burned them when he hit a ground rule double, and still, Pedro remained. And you could sense a disaster was about to ensue, and it did. As on the fifth pitch, Jorge Posada defined hitting it where they ain't with a blue pit that tied the game and stretched to a double with no one covering second. And finally, Pedro came out of the game, with the Yankee crowd letting him know. And the decision to leave him in looked worse when the bullpen was able to prevent the Yankees from scoring more runs. And in a tie game, the Yankees brought in the ultimate bullpen guy in Mariano Rivera who made easy work of the Red Sox in the ninth, and Mike Timlin did as well in the bottom half. So now things were going to extras, and Rivera had a scoreless 10th despite a David Ortiz double. And out of the bullpen for the Red Sox came their Game 1-4 and four starter in Tim Wakefield, and he went 1-2-3 to send things to the 11th. Then Marion remained and probably would have never left, and went 1-2-3. Wakefield remained on the mound, and on the first pitch of the inning, Aaron Boone, the trade deadline pickup who had his brother in the announcer's booth, would sit back and hit one over the left field wall to win the pennant for the Yankees. Boone's brother had tears in his eyes as Mariano Rivera ran to the mound and collapsed in joy as Boone was mobbed at home plate. Rivera would be carried off on his teammate's shoulders as he took home ALCS MVP as the Yankees were on top of the American League once again beating the rivals in the ALCS once again. And on the other side for the Red Sox, it was complete devastation. It can be seen in the faces in the dugout, and Kevin Millar would say there were grown men in the locker room crying uncontrollably. Even for fans who saw all the previous disappointments, this could have been the worst considering who they were facing. Boone would get the same treatment amongst Red Sox fans that Bucky Dent got, with some nicknaming him Aaron uh. Boone. And funny enough, both of these guys would eventually manage the Yankees. But unlike the Yankees after the Dent home run, the Yankees would lose the World Series after Boone's home run, losing in six to the Marlins. 
Boone's home run in the long term was one of the biggest of the 21st century. Without this, Boone is probably not the current Yankees manager. And in the short term, this home run led to what would happen in the following year. The main reason these two weren't going away is because they were both returning much of their team. Thanks in main part because they have more money than, say, a team like the defending World Series champion Marlins. But they both made two huge trades in the offseason. On November 28, 2003, the Red Sox traded Casey Fossum, Brandon Lyon, Jorge De La Rosa, and Michael Goss to the Diamondbacks for Kurt Schilling. Already proved to be one of the best postseason pitchers in the game, you wonder how much of a difference he would have made in 2003. And as for the Yankees, on February 16, 2004, they sent Alfonso Soriano and a player later revealed to be Joaquin Arias to the Texas Rangers in exchange for Alex Rodriguez, whose name had been constantly brought up in possible trades involving the Red Sox, including Manny Ramirez going to the Rangers. And ultimately, there would be no better fit for A-Rod than playing in New York, joining an already stacked team that lost a legend and Randy choked. Red Sox fans came into the season with expectations higher than ever that this would be the year that the curse ends, basically saying they were fully prepared to get hurt again. And the one who was leading them this year was former Phillies manager Terry Francona coming to take over after that whole leaving Pedro in for too long thing led to Grady Little's firing just three days after Game 7. And fans had reason to believe after a pretty good first month. And the season series started a month earlier than it did in 2003, as the Yankees and Red Sox faced for the first time in a four-game series on April 16th. For the first time since Mark McGuire's single-season home run record-breaking game in 1998, a regular season game was going to be nationally broadcasted. And the 5.3 million viewers were the most for a regular season game since then. And they saw the Red Sox win 6-2 in Boston, then take 3 out of 4. And just four days later, the Red Sox swept the Yankees in the Bronx. They were up two and a half games at the end of April, and while the Yankees were right there with them throughout all of May, things changed in June. The Yankees were in first on June 1st, and by the time the Red Sox faced the Yankees on the 29th, they were five and a half up. And by the end of the series, they were up eight and a half. And if you did the math, you'll realize the Yankees swept them, and they would keep on rolling going up by nine and a half games after beating them on July 23rd in Boston. But the 24th brought the day Red Sox fans and players can look back on as being the turning point of the season. In a game that started late because of rain, the Yankees took an early lead, and things got heated in the third after Gary Sheffield grounded into a run-scoring double play. Alex Rodriguez came up with two outs, and on a 1-1 pitch, Bronson Arroyo tried to go inside and hit A-Rod. And A-Rod did not like this even though Arroyo couldn't have thrown harder than 90 miles per hour. He began to yell fun too at Arroyo, and that's when Jason Baratek stepped in and his glove went straight at A-Rod's face. And the bench is cleared. A number of ejections and suspensions came as a result, including four games for Rodriguez and Baratek. But what some might forget is that this game was also an instant classic. The Red Sox would come back from the three-run deficit, but the Yankees would regroup and go up 9-4. to four. But the Red Sox shipped away at the lead, going into the bottom of the ninth down 10-8 to eight, with Mariano on the mound. Nomar would lead off the inning with a double, then Kevin Millar would hit a one-out single. And then on the fifth pitch of the at-bat, Bill Mueller would hit a two-run walk-off home run into the bullpen. A massive win that would completely change their season, especially after picking up another win the next night. Then just a few days later came the trade deadline. The Yankees didn't do much, but the Red Sox made a huge move as part of a four-team trade. They acquired Orlando Cabrera from the Expos, along with Doug Minkovich from the Twins, while they sent Matt Merton and Omar Garcia Parra to the Cubs. Kind of a shame Nomar wasn't a part of the 2004 team in the end. And they also acquired Dave Roberts from the Dodgers for Henry Stanley. Just like the Boone trade, this would be an unexpected one that would be huge in the end. The Red Sox would finish the season strong, going 42-18, and six games better than the Yankees. But the Yankees built such a lead that no one was catching them, and they were AL East champions for the seventh year in a row, while the Red Sox became the very familiar wildcard winner. And for the Yankees, it was just the same as 2003 in the ALDS. The Twins won the first game, but lost the next three, thus starting the longest postseason losing streak in North American sports, and allowing the Yankees to make the ALCS for the seventh time in the last nine seasons. Meanwhile, the Red Sox spirits were even higher as they swept the Angels in three games, scoring at least eight runs in every game, and winning the series with a David Ortiz walk-off home run, thus setting up the third ALCS matchup between these two teams and the second in a row. One felt more confident than ever that they were breaking their decades of agony, while the other wanted to preserve it. The Red Sox and Yankees have played 45 times in the past two years, with the Red Sox going 23-22. and 22. And the Red Sox outscored the Yankees in total by one run, 106-105, to 105, a matchup that could go either way, with a century of success favoring the Yankees. 
and both knew that this matchup was inevitable, with Theo Epstein and many in the Red Sox organization figuring they had to go through New York, and it would mean much more if they were able to. And in Game 1, the Red Sox had their big offseason pickup on the mound and Kurt Schilling going up against Mike Mussina. Schilling suffered a torn tendon in his right ankle in Game 1 of the ALDS, and it was clear that it was bothering him that night, as he gave up 6 runs in 3 innings, which is all he would pitch in the game. Mucina, however, was absolutely rolling, retiring the first 19 batters of the game before a bellhorn double ended the perfect game. The Red Sox actually put up 5 runs that inning and 2 in the 8th to bring themselves within 1, but the Yankees added 2 and won Game 1 10-7. Game 2 would be the pitching duel Game 1 was expected to be. With Pedro Martinez and John Liber on the mound, the Yankees scored in the first, and Pedro would work out of trouble through the innings until the Yankees took a 3-0 lead in the sixth, as Who's Your Daddy chance rained down from the crowd, stemming from a game a few weeks ago in which the Yankees scored 5 off Pedro, and Pedro later said all he could do was tip his cap and call the Yankees his daddy something he probably regretted saying immediately. The Red Sox could manage just one run off Lieber, as Mariano would save Game 2, just like he did in Game 1. So things went to Boston, and just like 1999, the Yankees were up 2-0. And while Game 2 was low scoring, Game 3 would more than make up for it. With Bronson Arroyo on the mound, the Yankees would open up the game with a 3-run home run from Hideki Matsui. But the lead didn't last long, as the Red Sox scored 4 off Kevin Brown in the 2nd. Then that lead wouldn't last long, as the Yankees scored 3 in the 3rd to go up by 2. A lead that also wouldn't last long, as the Red Sox added 2 in the bottom half. Then that tie wouldn't last long, as the Yankees scored 5 in the 4th, and they never lost that lead again, and decided to absolutely crush the Red Sox bullpen scoring 19 runs in this game, a postseason team record. Matsui had 5 hits, and him and A-Rod scored 5 runs, tying LCS records. There were 37 hits, and 20 extra base hits, another postseason record, which resulted in a 4 hour and 20 minute game, the longest 9 inning playoff game ever. And the look on Red Sox fans across Fenway was utter disappointment. A 3-0 lead was a death sentence in baseball, considering no team had even forced a game 7 to that point. And doing so against the powerhouse Yankees seemed to be an impossible task. But there was still an ounce of hope amongst the players and diehards. Dan Shaughnessy mentioned that the 19-8 score was close to 1918, the Red Sox last title, and a chant Yankees fans used to taunt them. But fans weren't listening, not looking forward to another winter of pain made easier thanks to this guy. And all they could do is take things one game at a time, knowing it was all a pipe dream. But the 2004 Red Sox took inspiration from the 2023 Celtics by saying, don't let us get one. And in game four, it didn't look like the Yankees were going to let them get one, as they took an early lead with an Alex Rodriguez to run home run, with the ball being thrown back on the field as tradition. Orlando Hernandez had not pitched in two weeks, but was cruising through the first four innings, until the fifth, when the Red Sox were able to plate three runs. But that lead didn't last long, as the Yankees went back up 4-3 in the sixth. Neither team scored in the seventh, and out of the bullpen came Barrion Rivera, looking for a six-out save. Manny got a leadoff hit, but the other three outs were easy putting the Red Sox three outs away from the inevitable dread. The Sox bullpen held the Yankees again in the ninth to put the deficit at just one, seemingly insurmountable with Mariano. But to lead off the bottom of the ninth, Mariano did the worst possible thing you can do to start off an inning by walking Kevin Millar. And out from the dugout came Dave Roberts to take Kershaw out of the game and pinch run for Kevin Millar. Stealing a base when the whole world knows you're about to is a very difficult task. And Rivera checked on him three times as the natural booze rained down. And on the first pitch Rivera threw, Roberts took off. And he got in just below the tag with no concern for a possible replay. And on the third pitch of the at-bat, Bill Mueller hit one up the middle just out of the reach of Rivera, going into center and allowing Roberts to score the tying run. Rivera's second blown save of the postseason and his fourth ever. The Red Sox still threatened, but didn't score that inning and things went to extras, a common occurrence with these teams. Both teams went down easy in the 10th, but threatened in the 11th with runners on. That ultimately resulted in nothing. And after the Yankees went down in order after Jorge Posada's single in the 12th, Paul Quantrill came into the game and gave up a single to Manny Ramirez. And up came David Ortiz. And on the fourth pitch, he would hit the ball into the bullpen to give the Red Sox the game for a win, becoming the first player to ever hit two walk-off home runs in one postseason. And that kept their hopes alive, in the dramatic way they needed. The hopes were still very dim, considering they were still down 3-1, but it wasn't 3-0. And considering they were still down in Schilling's injury, Pedro started on short rest in Game 5, while Mike Nusina started on normal rest, and the Red Sox got to him early, scoring two in the first. Bernie Williams went hit a solo home run in the second, and the 2-1 score would remain until the sixth, when Derek Jeter's two-out double scored three runs. Martinez would come out after the inning, and things remained 4-2 until the eighth. Ortiz hit another home run to lead off the inning, Millar walked again, 
and pinch runner Dave Roberts went to third on Nixon single. Ben Rivera was forced to come in the eighth again, and the first batter he faced, Jason Baratek, would hit a game-tying sack fly. This goes down as a blown save for Rivera, even though it really wasn't his fault. But still, for the second night in a row, the Red Sox had the game off Rivera, and after neither team could bring runners home, things were going to extras for the second night in a row. Extra innings saw close calls in almost every inning, as the runner reached an all but the top of the tenth in the first three extra innings. And with Tim Wakefield in, Baratek had to catch him. He usually didn't as he wasn't great at catching knuckleballs, and it was evident when he allowed three pass balls. But the Yankees still could not score off him, despite threatening. And in the bottom of the 14th, again, a rally served with a walk. This a one-out walk to Johnny Damon. Cabrera would strike out, Manny Ramirez would walk, bringing up Game 4 hero David Ortiz. And after a 10-pitch at-bat, Ortiz hit one softly into center, reminiscent of Posada's hit in 2003, and Johnny Damon scored to win another extra inning game as Ortiz hit another walk-off. It was a very similar game to Game 4. A Millar walk and Dave Roberts' pinch run was huge as Rivera blew a save, then Ortiz had a walk-off in extra innings. And after playing the longest 9-inning postseason game in Game 3, this was the longest postseason game ever at 5 hours and 49 minutes, with half of the game being Jorge Posada mound meetings. They were the third team to ever force a Game 6 after going down 3-0, and none of those teams forced a Game 7. But this felt different from the others because the momentum the Red Sox had was huge. After doctors underwent a procedure on Kurt Schilling, he was able to start Game 6. On a cold, windy night, it was hard to generate offense, but the Sox were able to in the fourth after a two-out Veritek single, and the struggling Mark Bellhorn, who hit one into the left field stands that hit a fan's hands and was initially called in play by Jim Joyce. But after discussion, there wasn't another Jeffrey Meyer situation, and it was called a three-run home run. Schilling would pitch seven innings, giving up one run, and luckily only had to field his position once in which he limped to cover first. The Yankees did not take advantage of this injury by bunting, and as a result of his performance, his sock that was bloodied by the end, invisibly seen, became a part of history. And another part of history came in the eighth. Bronson Arroyo relieved Schilling, and Dieter Single cut the lead down to two. Then Alex Rodriguez came up to face his buddy Bronson, and he hit a dribbler down the line that Arroyo picked up. He then attempted to tag A-Rod, and A-Rod slapped his glove, causing the ball to fall out. A-Rod went to second, and Jeter scored. But after conversation, umpires called him out for interference, and Jeter was ordered to go back to first. Already upset and anxious, Yankee fans did not react well to the call, and began to throw trash on the field, causing Terry Francona to take his players off the field. Order would be restored, and Arroyo would get out of the inning unscathed. But things didn't end peacefully. In the ninth, Orlando Cabrera hit into a potential double play, and in a close play was called safe at first. This being the third close play that went against the Yankees. Their fans threw more trash on the field, and after discussions with the NYPD and Michael Bloomberg, officers came out of the dugout with Ryan Giron. They got out of the inning unscathed, and in the bottom half, despite a leadoff Matsui walk, the Yankees could not score, and now for the first time in MLB history, a team down 3-0 had forced a Game 7. And this was different than any other. A team had a chance to overcome nearly a century of shortcomings, while the Yankees and their fan base was more anxious than ever. But still, another game had to be played. For motivation, the Red Sox watched the movie Miracle before the game. For the Yankees, they had Bucky Dent throw out the first pitch for a gentle reminder of who they still were. And in the most watched LCS game in history, Kevin Brown was on the mound for the Yankees and Derek Lowe was on the mound for the Red Sox. And the Red Sox got started early. Despite Damon getting thrown out at the plate, David Ortiz would hit a two-run home run in the first, and one inning later, the Red Sox loaded the bases and Brown was pulled from the game. Then on the very first pitch Javier Vasquez would throw, Johnny Damon would hit it over the right field wall for a grand slam, silencing all of New York City except for Mets fans that were hate-watching, a play that brought the Red Sox win probability up to 91%. Derek Lowe on two days rest would pitch six innings, giving up just one run with an 8-1 lead thanks to another Damon home run. Pedro Martinez came in relief and was shamelessly greeted with Who's Your Daddy chance. That intensified as the Yankees began to rally, but the Yankees could only manage two runs as the 8-3 lead would grow to 10-3 as Mike Timlin came out for the ninth. After walking Kenny Lofton with two outs, Francona took no chances and took Timlin out for Alan Embry, who two pitches later got Ruben Sierra to ground out. And they had done it. For the first and only time in MLB history, a team came back from a 3-0 deficit. And it was the Red Sox doing so in the ALCS against their bitter rivals that owned them for more than 80 years. Long-suffering fans were in jubilation, along with young fans who had suffered for a year. And while fans celebrated, they still had more games to play to ultimately vanquish the curse, although it seemed inevitable at this point. The Red Sox would go up against the Cardinals in the World Series, and this was the best Cardinal team of the era despite the outcome. They had three of the top five MVP candidates in Albert Pools, Scott Rowland, and Jim Edmonds, along with Larry Walker and a young Yadier Molina. 
This team will eventually have four Hall of Famers, but at that point, I don't think any team was going to beat the Red Sox. And it showed. That insane Cardinals offense showed itself in Game 1 by scoring 9 runs, but the Red Sox scored 11 thanks to an 8th inning 2-run home run for Mark Bellhorn. And for the rest of the series, the Cardinals scored just 3 runs with a few misplays. Fate just seemed to be in the Red Sox hands as they won Game 4, fittingly 3-0 to officially vanquish the curse of the Bambino, as a total lunar eclipse appeared over Bush Stadium. Fans who suffered for a long time felt they could finally die peacefully, while letting the young fans know how spoiled they were. And it's just so obvious that the rivalry was and will never be the same after all of this. 2003 and 2004 were really the peak years, but 2005 was also a part of it, because everything now was different. The Red Sox received their rings at Fenway on April 3rd before playing the Yankees. And now, Yankee fans couldn't chant 1918, though they came up with new ones about the Red Sox winning their necks in 2090. And with that in mind, it's easy to see the parallels between the start of the 20th century and the 21st century in regards to the rivalry. The Red Sox made it clear that this was a new era, and 2004 wasn't a one-time thing by winning the 2007 World Series along with 2013 and 2018, beating the Yankees in the ALDS that year and winning the wildcard game in 2021. The Yankees did win the World Series in 2009, but the 2010s were the first decade since the 1910s that the Yankees didn't play in a World Series. While the Red Sox won every World Series they played in this time, just like they did in the first 18 years of the 20th century. And this is all a stretch, but it is noteworthy that the curse began after winning the 1918 World Series, and 100 years later, the Red Sox would win again with one of the best teams of all time, and have gone down since. And if you want to bring up a trade, Ruth was sold after 1919. And after 2019, Mookie Betts was traded to the Dodgers, what is pretty much already certified as a lopsided trade, as Mookie won the World Series in his first year in LA, and now plays with the modern Babe Ruth, as the Dodgers have built themselves to be like the Steinbrenner Yankees, who just spend more money than anyone. Obviously this is all just a stretch and an observation, and doesn't really actually mean anything, but it further shows that 2003-05 through was the absolute peak of this rivalry that will probably never be duplicated. The decades of struggle for the Red Sox was a big reason this rivalry was so heated, along with just the history and location behind it. The personalities driven with the help of tons of media attention made this whole ordeal bigger than the game. And these two somehow facing the ALCS in back-to-back -back years at the peak of their performance and hatred, and ending with a walk-off home run in one year and a 3-0 comeback the next, defined peak baseball. In a rivalry that would never be the same, unless of course, that observation is true, and we get to relive it all again in 2103 and 2104.